Hamster penis. My brother used to call me that. <laughs> so that's the why you are the way you are. Yes, yes, absolutely. <laughs> I think it has something to do with it. Hold on one second. Mm. Speaking of hamster penis. Yeah, um, indeed. So you know how my son's hamster got out? Uh, and, yes. And escaped, and, and we were never able to find it. Yeah. And I trapped a variety of rodents up in the attic, and none of them were the hamster. Uh-oh. So the other day, I got to take Jack to a reptile show. Because Jack wants to add to his ever-growing collection of reptiles. I've got two in the basement. Yes. He doesn't want my he doesn't, bearded dragons. He, he treats bearded dragons with some level of disdain. I'm not sure. <laughs> They're not, like, cool enough. Mm. Anyway, um, we end up at the pet store to get dog food. And Ben, knowing that I'm taking Jack to the hamster to the hamster show, to the reptile show the next day, <laughs> insists on me buying him two, some other type of rodent to keep in the house. So, you, like, make up for it. Yes. I see. So he gets two mice. Mice? Mice. They're like the ones I've been trapping upstairs right. yeah. for the last few weeks. And uh, did you know you can pick them up by the tail? I, You're supposed I, to. I've never handled a mouse before. Well. I wish I could. You want to come over and handle my mouse? <laughs> <laughs> ah, wrong dun, fucking dun. thing. Um, yeah, so I, I now have, there's two mice and Erin won't go in Ben's room and it's this whole thing. <laughs> no, she likes, she likes the mice. And did you name the mice? <laughs> yes. What what did you name the mice? Um Biggie Cheese and Lil Cheese. <laughs> <laughs> it's very inspiring. Yes. My, uh Jack name helped Ben name them. Uh Jack's been listening to some hip hop lately. What do you actually, what do you feed to a mouse? Does it just eat like more like mouse food well, or as one would expect on Long Island, uh at the pet store you can buy they them eat bagels like, and locks? you can buy them an everything bagel. <laughs> But the seeds on top are like mouse seeds, like that they want to eat. Oh, so it's like an everything. It looks like an everything bagel, and they just peck peck the seeds and eat the top. Interesting, yeah. huh? So and I just the, uh, I needed to get that out. And we're back. Welcome to Recovery in the Middle Ages, the podcast about two middle aged suburban dads in their pursuit of life, love, and recovery. I'm Nat X. I'm Mike R. And boy, do we have a show for you. Today on RMA, we discuss James Brown's L.A. Diaries in This River. I feel good. Two parts of his three-book addiction memoir series. And Mike returns from the Southlands with tales of grab-and-go cocktails, shrimp and grits, and a renewed sense of purpose on his triumphant return. All this and more today on a very, very special edition of RMA. Hey, hey. And welcome back. Um, You're listening to <laughs> Mike Mike. 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 I feel like this is a bad trip. You're on RMA Radio. Mike and Nat in the morning. <laughs> That's so disorienting. That <laughs> I think any of our listeners who are stoned will enjoy that. Kyle did that one. Yeah, Kyle. I, can we do one that's a little more like straight, straight ahead? I'm thinking like 80s morning radio. Do you want to sound like the morning uh, zoo? Kind of Z100. I think it would be funny. I don't know. I kind of like it. Two for Tuesdays with Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Double shots. Today's Taco Tuesday. It is. Do you eat tacos? I see you. You have a um, a hunk of turkey meat defrosting on your counter kitchen counter what's that what, do you, what what is planned for that meat well i have a don't ask don't tell policy with um with our dinners <laughs> my wife just tells me to do things and i do them so i got a text this morning as i was doing my chores making beds doing dishes and she sends me a text that says can you take the uh, frozen turkey out of the freezer and uh, put it on the counter. Mm. And because I am a yes man, and I do what I'm supposed to, yeah. and when my wife says jump, I say how high? So I just took it out, but I didn't ask any questions. I would presume it's going to be some kind of ragu. Like a sauce? 
Actually, she made sauce last night. Turkey Tetrazzini, maybe? I, I think it's Tuesday. We do tacos on Tuesdays. So. Turkey Taco Tuesday. I think that's what's going on. Totally. Here. I think we've discovered what, what, what the point of that frozen turkey is. Yeah. So that Hershey's Kiss that's sitting right next to it has nothing to do with tonight's dinner. Totally You're not going to make a turkey mole. No. 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 There, there's a uh, frozen turkey and a, and a lonely looking, I'll take a picture of it. <laughs> And this is what you get on the Patreon. If I were your wife, I would tell you to put a plate under that so it doesn't get moisture all over the counter. What, the uh, Hershey the Kiss? No, the turkey. Oh, yeah. And if you join the Patreon, you could see a picture of it, which brings me to... <laughs> there's a, there's an incentive for you guys. Well, this episode uh, of Recovery in the Middle Ages is brought to you by our Patreon page. It's patreon.com slash recovery in the Middle Ages. You get some video episodes. <laughs> We're going to make more soon. Uh, but the best part about it is in three months, you get a very cool exclusive recovery in the Middle Ages mug and... Or sticker if you're cheap. Or sticker. And you also get the Discord where we chat and it's like a private recovery chat. Discord and, be uh, popping. We're popping. Lots we're getting, going on in the Discord. Yeah, so uh, join us at uh, patreon.com slash recovery the middle ages. Did you see I added yeah. two uh, discussion boards or whatever you call those things? Two no. threads. What are the two new threads? Because I added a couple. Uh, One is um, Buddhism mm -hmm. and Bhakti and Zen, I think, maybe, or something, or Hinduism. And the other was Christianity and Judaism. Ooh, I thought we weren't supposed to discuss religion. Uh, well... Next week's guest, who is now confirmed for next week, Very is going to be a woman who Becoming is from the Hare Krishnas, oh. and she has a, a long history of substance abuse. She's been sober for many years now, but um, she runs the Bhakti Recovery Group, which is, I guess, the Hare Krishna Recovery Groups. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm kind of interested to see what that's all about. I want to hear her story, her tales of drug use in Manhattan yeah. back in the 80s and 70s. And uh, she, she seems. It's, I think it's going to be really interesting. Yeah, yeah. I uh, kind of ran into her through another podcast I listened to. So cool. So yeah, yeah we've got some guests. So that's why up. that's that was like the the genesis behind why I created these religious oriented. Uh, I should probably put an agnostic slash atheist one up there too, right? Because we have a bit of everybody. Well, but you're segregating all of the yeah. religious and spiritual. You know, what if there was just one? big ecumenical group we have that it's called like the general discussion yeah <laughs> people can talk about anything what happens if it. an atheist posts in the the, the buddhism thread will yeah, they be what? ejected immediately no it will we'll just you know yeah our discussion, it's acceptance it's all about acceptance yeah our discussions yes. are all very open and um, i mean we don't have any yeah. assholes in there we'll just kick them out yeah. if they cause trouble yeah <laughs> that's pretty much how it's going right now so everybody's cool everybody's supportive we say good morning good night and how are you doing that sounds like a Broadway song. <laughs> good morning. Good night. How are you doing How today? How are you doing today? Um, this is what we talk about. We have nothing to talk about. Well, do we have any reviews to read? We don't. Uh, oh, we don't. But we might have, what do you call those things? A voicemail. Yeah. I feel like uh, Ryan left maybe uh, an update and then we didn't play it because it was too late. Maybe do Ryan's update. Well, we skipped a, a week, you know. So Dark week. The theater was dark. It's actually only um, one voicemail. That's okay. from Ryan. Let's see. Okay. This is Rhino. Hi, Rhino. He's coming. No, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. <laughs> this is not supposed to work that way. Yeah, R uh, Ryan's been uh, looking pretty good. Sounds like he's doing better. If you guys remember, he's a, you know, a monster that's been updating us. Uh, and his recovery and so yeah and so and so this is his update voicemail outside of chicago calling to just say what's up hello and check in um i guess there's a decent amount going on man i uh just had this uh big giant cardiology workup after years and years and years and years of undiagnosed symptoms man that uh that kind of put it in my head that I may or may not drop dead at any second. Uh, very unnerving stuff. Uh, you know, like arrhythmias, palpitations, chest pain, and or pressure. And, uh, you know, of course, you know, you go on Google and, uh, you know, one of two things. Either you're okay or, you know, you have COVID, cancer, and AIDS in your heart, and you're going to need a transplant like tomorrow. So, 
you know, my, my drug abuse was the reason I neglected it for so long. You know, I just never get my shit together long enough to handle it. But I, I did. I went with cardiologists, had a series of workups. And uh, while there is some issues, it's all benign in nature, as, as far as I'm told. So now I have to work on stress and anxiety and, more importantly, my fucking diet. Because ever since I've been, uh, you know, doing the right thing and trying to stay clean and, uh, you know, my best behavior, you know, uh, I've been eating like a complete asshole. And uh, <clears throat> I have to remember going into a middle-aged podcast, which means that I fit that demographic, even if just barely. So I have to start, start watching what I eat because I don't rebound the same as I did when I was 20 years old, uh, eating ice cream and pizza all day. It's Ain't that bad. The truth. And it uh, wrecks my nerves and it, uh, it makes my, all my symptoms worse. So, you know, it's like that other thing, man. You know, put down the uh, spoon and pick up the fork. I've heard an NA before. Yep. Hmm. And that was Rhina. No, no, no. Yeah. That's, there's yep. more. But... Put down the spoon, meaning heroin. Um, so, I got, you know, it's just working on these other fucking addictions, man, you know, but, uh, I just wanted to call and check in. You know, the Medicaid thing is still on hold. I'm not sure if I'm going to lose my coverage. Uh, so I'm a little worried about that. But all in all, things are good, man. I just want to say, hey, how you doing? And uh, I love you all. I love our nation, Dopey Nation. Much love. Peace. Motherfuckers. <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Always good to hear from you. Yeah. Ryan brings up a couple of interesting points. Mm. First, Ryan, Occam's Razor. Chances are you don't need a heart transplant. <laughs> probably, <laughs> probably. I mean, I'm not. I'm Nat and I are not physicians, as you're probably aware. Not yet. No. But uh, yeah, that how's that correspondence course going? <laughs> so, <laughs> University um, of Phoenix Medical School. I would like to share my experience with 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 the audience. Because yes. when I quit smoking crack in 1991, wow. Um, there was a, a lull of a couple of years there where I was trying to get my life back on track. And I, after like a year, went completely fucking bonkers. I thought that I had a heart condition. Yeah. So this this really resonates with me. I um, I had one incidence of like AFib where your heart kind of goes like a bunch of noodles, like blah, blah, blah. it yeah. doesn't like have a normal beat. And it was after I took this, this antihistamine, this, this Tavis D, which is no longer on the market for this reason what I understand. Um, and I couldn't get it out of my head that all of the crack smoking and everything that I had done had created these, this horrible permanent damage yeah. that I was never going to be able to recover from and that I could drop dead at any moment. Exactly like what this guy's going through, what Ryan is going through. So I went trips to the emergency room. Um, you know, I stopped running because I had started running to like uh, as a, a recovery thing to quit the crack. Uh, and I just basically became like a hermit for a, for almost a year. Just out of, just out of fear, fear that if I had yeah. used my heart too much, it would explode in my <laughs> chest, right? So this was making things difficult at work because I still had to go to work, right? right. So I'd go to work and I, I'd leave work. I'd go to the emergency room. I'd set up all these doctor's appointments with cardiologists and they looked at everything and they're like, you're as healthy as a fucking ox, dude. Like, There's nothing. You didn't do any permanent damage. There's nothing wrong. Um and I just didn't believe it, though. Was it know? like rebound anxiety? Yeah, like, it was. It, so that that's. I finally got a doctor who was like, "Listen, there's nothing wrong with your heart, but I think you might want to like consider that what you have is some kind of anxiety disorder." You Were know? you drinking after you quit uh, smoking? S so not for like two years. So you like quit crack and alcohol simultaneously. Simultaneously, and I started running and I quit smoking too. So there could have also been some like withdrawal effects and um, Yeah, but it was weird because um, there was a gap and during that like from when I quit to when the symptoms showed up. It was like it was like 6 months, maybe a year. Oh. Yeah. Yeah, so that's So yeah. that's why, I, you know, but really it was my own psyche like I don't know if it was like trying to process all of the addiction stuff or, you know, just because I hadn't dealt with any of that stuff. Yeah. It was like coming out in different in a different way. So they put me on Paxil for a while and I, I really I took it for a little while and I didn't like the side effects, so I didn't take it. And then I think I might have told this story before, but since I'm middle aged and so are our listeners, they won't remember either. <laughs> I um there was a huge snowstorm in nineteen ninety three in Brooklyn and it shut down the whole city and I was stuck for like a, a week in the house and my car was parked on the street probably about 20 yards from the entrance to the BQE because that's kind of where I lived over there in Greenpoint on Morgan Avenue. 
and um, eventually work was like, you have to come in. I, you know, Long Island has been plowed. What is the problem yeah. in Brooklyn? And I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> Ask the fucking Department of Sanitation what the problem is. But they're like, you have to come in or it's going to be a problem. So I get out of my bed, my sick bed, where I think I'm going to be dead of a bad heart in a week. I grab a snow shovel mm-hmm. and I literally shoveled the entire street <laughs> so I could drive my car onto the BQE and go to Long Island to go to work. I wow. was reverse commuting. And uh, after I did that, I'm like, well, if I had a heart condition, this would have killed me. Right. And it didn't kill me. So I put the snow shovel back and I never had another fucking wow. problem after that. I mean, I still had anxiety. I still, you know, but it wasn't like, uh, it wasn't like paralyzing me anymore. So right. I don't know, Ryan, maybe grab a snow shovel. You got plenty of snow in Chicago, but no, no, don't listen to my advice because it's <laughs> terrible advice because your situation may not be what my situation is, but. Yeah, but if you're, uh, if you're getting all like clears from the doctor, yeah. then you know consider consider addressing anxiety. Probably not with benzodiazepines, though. Yeah, don't do that. Yeah, um, benzos are uh, meditation, all this stuff. Meditation. I I really got a lot out of um, running when I was having yeah. good time anxiety, and I might have to do that again. But yeah, I mean, I I'll never forget. You know, uh, after a long run for me, I get into the, like a rehab or something. And then after you come out of that stupor, Mm -hmm. you know, somewhat, and you start to, like, realize, like, where you are, what has happened, and what's ahead of you, it's like, and a lot of stuff starts coming back to, like, your rational mind, and you just, like, it's all flashing. And, uh, And that creates a tremendous amount of anxiety. Like, one of the reasons I was, you know, medicating like that myself is to avoid feeling these. I mean, I think most right. people do. You're trying to avoid feeling things, thinking about things. So once you get sober, now you've got a real problem because it all comes rushing back. But the good news is you can then process that stuff. But you need to be in, in a supportive uh, situation, either with a, a therapist or in a, a 12-step group or an RMA, Zoom, something. Or you can not process it like I did and go back to drinking for another two decades. Yeah, that's the that's the fear. <laughs> that's the yeah. other. That's the other way you could go. The uh, the other thing he brought up, which I I liked uh, hearing about, although not so good for him, is the you know put down the spoon, pick up the fork thing. Yep. Uh, there's your addiction whack a mole just popping up. Yeah, it's know? changing seats in the Titanic. They call yeah. it. Um, I, I heard that a lot in the rooms and. Um, I listen to like hundreds of these. Uh, there's an app called uh, Sober Meditations, I think. And it's a really great app. It was free and it has like some of the best 12 step speakers, you know, from these conventions on, and you can listen to them. And I remember I heard that with a few different guys were talking about how they put down the bottle and picked up a fork, basically, right. like, because you do get that dopamine, you get, you feel good when you eat, and it's easy to sort of just transfer. You know, that kind of, you're, you're craving to that. And bacon, then it gets dangerous. Bacon is a drug. It can be. Yeah, I you agree. Um, Smoked bacon. Smoked bacon? Yeah, you can smoke it. <laughs> Should you? <laughs> you never had smoked bacon. Oh, I thought you meant like in a pipe. Well, you could do that too. Okay. <laughs> yeah, bacon is great. I like it in milkshakes. I, I wanted to get a, I'm going to leave that alone. <laughs> I wanted to get a smoker, like, and start smoking meats. But the last thing I need is, is to be ingesting more carcinogens. Maybe. Maybe. I think we're on. You want to go in on a smoker? I kind of want to. You have to. a deck. We could smoke salmon? Yeah. Interesting. That's, we could make our own belly locks. That would be re- amazing. That'd be worth it. Wouldn't it? I think so. Holy shit. Let's get a smoker. Let's get a smoker. I love it. All right. Is there anything illegal we can do with a smoker just before we go down that road? Uh, I don't think so. I think we're we're clear. I think we'll be good. Okay. Um, So how was your week? I feel like we took a dark week um, and so much has happened. I feel like every day of my life, so much goes down that it's just like, it's crazy. And uh, I'm sorry that, you know, we we weren't able to do the show last week, but uh, that morning, I mean, I felt like, talk about sober, you know, bottoms type of thing. I was so overwhelmed. I mean, everything came in, like, hit me at the same time. And and on top of it, I wasn't prepared, and I had to, I forget what the hell I was doing even, but, you know, and I just had to tell Mike, I said, man, I I can't, I can't go. Yeah. You have to know your limits. And I said, if I do a show, I'm in such a bad headspace, it's going to suck, and, you know, it's going to be really difficult, and you were headed out on a trip. So we thought it best you yeah. know, know our limits and just kind Absolutely. of, you know, uh, but you went away for, what was it for work or? Yeah. I had a work conference in Savannah, 
Georgia. What was that like? I've been to Savannah before. It's a beautiful southern city. Um, there's all that old architecture. I don't know if, if you've ever read or heard of the book uh, Midnight in the Garden of Good and Evil. That all, ta- it, that all takes place in, in Savannah. Huh. And uh, Savannah and the local college, SCAD, which is South Carolina. No, something, something, arts and design. Mm. I don't know. Um, they kind of work together with the government there to make sure that the city still looks like it does hmm. when, in the antebellum southern period. That's interesting. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It's a very cool city uh, architecturally. It, it, it's also, although it does, it, it really encourages the consumption of booze. Like you can drink on the street there, <laughs> um, like sort of like in New Orleans. Yeah, but, no open container laws. No, in, in fact, right on the river walk there, there are these slushy. Um, businesses where you just go in and all they have are like you know how they have the the slushy machines yeah like and they're all alcohol slushy and they give it to you in a cup and then they encourage you to walk around uh the streets wow you know drinking uh in fact you know you go to these conferences and they always have some guy who's like does the welcome to welcome to whatever wherever you are you know Mm -hmm. and they tell you all the things that you don't have time to do right (laughs) you should do all these things but meanwhile you're stuck in a windowless room for three days um one of the things he said is like, do what the locals do, get yourself a cocktail and walk around the street and explore, you know? That's their like official welcome, like here's what you do, yes. you grab a cocktail, you walk around. Start drinking. Wow. When you get there. Um, so that was a little weird. Um, but I, you know, I got there early um, the day before the conference started because I wanted to walk around and I, and I did. And there was a lot, a lot of people drinking cocktails and stuff, but it didn't really affect my appreciation of the city of... Was the it architecture? like with people like drunk or just no, kind no, of no, no, no? People were chilling, huh. you know, which is more insidious for somebody like me because I see all these people having yeah. a great time drinking a nice icy cold cocktail. It was eighty five degrees when I got there, yeah. you know, and I'm like, mm, that that would have been nice sometime in the past, but um, that was fine. I mean, there was open bars at the conference. Uh, there was a reception with an open bar, but very few people at the conference were drinking, which mm. I, I noticed, um, which I would not have noticed when I was drinking. Right. Um, but there, it wasn't like a big push for everybody to go out and to get drunk. Um, the last night I was there though, uh, I was, I, I had a, there's a colleague that I work with over the years who works in the jury research business. Like he puts on mock trials and stuff. Mm. So, uh, I, I become friends with him over the years. So we were going to go out and get some dinner. And, uh, I texted my boss. I was like, do you and your wife want to go and, and get tacos with us? And there, he was like, sure. You know, we're just walking back from the riverfront. Uh, we'll meet you in the hotel lobby in like a half an hour. So I look at him and he knows I don't drink. He actually knows we do this podcast. Okay. He's like the only person in my work orbit that I have let know that I have this alternative life of, you know, <laughs> is this recovery your al- podcast, your guy. alternative lifestyle, because he's like a PhD psychologist. And, oh, wow. you know, he, he, uh, really cut back on his drinking. He barely drinks at all. So anyway, we were both like, uh, let's go to the bar, uh, and wait. So we're like, okay. Cause I was kind of curious. I'm like, you know, I haven't been in a bar. Like I, yeah. I just don't go to bars. Even at these conferences, I don't go to the bar, get a drink and wait for something to happen because that's like stupid. Right. Yeah. But I figure it was this guy and it was he, safe. Yeah. Like, and he safe. tells me he's like, there's, they have all of these zero proof options on, mm. on the drink menu. And I was like, okay, you know, I'll do that. So I go in and, and sure enough, the bar at this hotel, um, had, a whole page of non-alcoholic cocktails. Oh. So I order one and he orders one too, not non-alcoholic. And then, um, you know, but <laughs> they serve him in these stem glasses. It looks like a margarita glass, yeah. like a very ladylike presentation, you know, <laughs> which has always been sort of my, they're shaming my you. irritation yeah. with these mocktails. Like you can't like put it in a, a manly, like they're rock like, glass or something, like a you mug, know? you know, yeah, or just something. But so <laughs> My boss walks in, he takes one look at us, like drinking out of these things, and he just starts laughing. He's like, you know, I never get used to give you shit either when all you would drink was Sauvignon Blanc. You know? <laughs> so I was like, yeah, I guess I have that reputation. <laughs> but we were late going out to the restaurant because they took kind of took their time getting there. So he, so I'm looking at my watch. I'm like, all right, we should go. So I pick up the drink and I just slam it. And uh, <laughs> you slam it. You got to drink the whole thing. I gulped the whole thing down in like one gulp and I barely started it when they got there. And he just looks at me funny because he doesn't know it's a mocktail. He thinks I'm just, oh yeah. 
he just thought I was like ripping back like a uh, some kind of a margarita or something. And I'm like, it's just juice. And, and but I don't think he really understood what I meant by that. Yeah. You know, because like I've told him that I don't drink. I've told him at numerous conferences, and the guy still buys me a bottle of wine for Christmas. Like I don't know what he's thinking. Yeah, he's not paying attention. <laughs> not paying attention. Great guy. I mean, you know, I get along very well with him. We have a, we've known each other 15 years now. But so that was that was my little uh, cocktail moment there. But uh, I, I really. There was another couple in the bar who started talking about um, the homeless and, you know, they were advancing a political line that I wasn't exactly comfortable with, but it was fine. Yeah, but they were, he was drinking whiskey and, yeah. you know, was definitely into his cups a little bit, if you know what I mean. And that's, I, uh, that's when the real opinions come out. Yes. Yes. And it gets scary. But overall, like I felt very comfortable being around the booze, being around the scene. Um, I ate a lot of shrimp and grits, which is like the big the big thing to eat shrimp down there. Shrimp and grits, huh? It's really good. Interesting. It's like yeah. a breakfast shrimp no, dish No, 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 no. <laughs> like, <laughs> why not have sh- shrimp in your oatmeal? You know, I've never considered it. Usually it's raisins. Have you never seen shrimp in a Bloody Mary, like a fried shrimp? Um, hanging off the edge of a Bloody Mary Yeah, class. yeah, I think I have seen yeah. that. That sounds, yeah. Anyway, it's not. But this I, is grits. Maybe people eat this for breakfast in the South? I don't know. I would. I don't know. Melissa would know. Uh, she's from Georgia. Right also. to Mike R at middleagesrecovery.com. <laughs> uh, I, I believe we eat shrimp and grits. One eats shrimp and grits for dinner because that's what we did. We had it at dinner time. Huh. Yeah. That sounds good. Yeah. Um, Melissa K. Me, yes. Melissa K. And yeah. uh, she's active on the, on the, the discord. Um, yeah. I've noticed that too. Like I feel like I used to get really uh, scared of going to like drinking, um, you know, parties or, you know, events and things like that as I should have been. But um, now we just kind of, um, yeah, it's, I feel more like an anthropologist, like kind of just, <laughs> like, or a sociologist, like watching people's behavior. Right. You know, it's kind of like I'm trying to like see when that, when that switch flips and, you know, it's like the person is one way and then all of a sudden two, two and a half drinks, there's a different like oh, tenor yeah. to their, you know, what they're saying yeah. and it gets a little more, intense you know and you could tell they're feeling whatever you know and it, it, that's when i start to back away and i never get into arguments with no. people like that you just yeah sure sure i mean i used to see not not drinking as like a bug but now i see it as a feature mm. you know it's like I, I because i i go to some of these conference parties and i look at people and i'm like watch if they they hitting it a little too hard and they get sloppy and, and then i sort of reevaluate like how I work with them in the future business wise, because mm. you know, if it's, especially if it's like a repetitive pattern, cause I see a lot of the same people conference to conference, you know, and I can tell which ones really maybe need to dial it back a little bit. Yeah. Because you get, need to rely I mean, on someone. Not like that, that I'm taking every and anyone else's inventory, <laughs> but, uh, like that's what you're doing. It, I, true. But you know what, you know, and, and I mean, what's fair is fair, right? I'm sure these people were, judging me for the last however many years based yeah. on my behavior at some of these things you know? yeah well it's also a survival thing you're just you know taking um in, you know taking that inventory for a good reason you know you know, like um, do i want to work with that person if they're uh, you know capable of um disappearing for a few days on a bender or something you don't want to yeah i don't really have a choice of who i can work with and who i can't but uh it's <laughs> it's you know it's just something it's there yeah my wife christine went away um that's what I'm going through sort of right now is uh, last weekend she she went away for a night. Next weekend she's away Friday to really Friday to Sunday. Um and you know this week Where's she going? She has like all of these friends and last weekend it was I think the parent friends of Max and they went to a winery. Oh. But they went on Saturday, stayed uh Saturday night and then came back Sunday. So that wasn't like a full weekend but um, so she said it was a lot of fun. It's a lot of like sort of newish friends of hers now. And, uh, she said they got a house and everything. One of the moms like had a place out there. Oh, wow. And she, I go in the morning, she, she texts me, Oh, good morning. I said, how'd it go? She goes, I was up all night because somebody she was with got like wasted <laughs> and then was like puking. A oh lot. no. But you know, she said it was kind of one of those things where they're kind of younger than us and it's their first kid. Oh, okay. And this was the first time a lot of these, uh, 
moms have been away. Right. Um, and so it was just, uh, it's funny because she doesn't really drink that much. We partially have ruined her drinking <laughs> and she has confessed to me. She goes, oh, I feel, I feel guilty now and I want to have a glass of wine. You know, I feel like am I doing it every day? Should I be? Why do I need this? You know? And so, yeah, we're in her head. So she's not getting as wasted as, uh, as the other people. That's a win. That's a win. That's a win. Um, <laughs> That's, that's I was dragging my wife down to the gutter with me, and so she's she probably drinks I don't know a lot less too. But yeah, yeah, uh, I don't feel bad. I think that's okay. And the other things were um, we we're uh, so. What did you do when she was out winery? Ah, what did I do? I'd have to remember. So basically, yes, you would. <laughs> this is the show where we talk about what we did. We I should remember. <laughs> we played a lot of video games, uh, and we hung out, watched TV. Um, I, you know, I gave up on trying to bring them to church on Sunday. They were just, because oh, we had the time change. And I said, Oh, that t- fucking sucked, man. God damn this time change. Speaking of church. And, uh, but, God damn it. God damn, God damn this what, fucking time change. Uh, and everybody. Jesus Christ, would you look at the time? Every, everybody <laughs> is feeling this stupid time change. And apparently, uh, you know, so basically we kept it very low key. Um, I had on Saturday, one of Max's friend's mom. She asked me a couple of weeks ago, I, I need somebody to watch you know, my son on a Saturday. Mm. Would it be okay, 8.45 on a Saturday morning? <laughs> Would you do it? Sure, and sure. of course, this was two weeks away. I said, yeah, absolutely <laughs> no problem at all. 8.45 rolls around. The night before, Max slept on the couch. And like it was this whole thing. Like we, It was like nobody slept that well. Right. And so 8.45, here comes this eight-year-old. And, uh, and so I had that going on. And... Uh, my little cousin, my little nephew was going to sleep over and then, and that guy Jesus. canceled. Yeah, it was. Oh, he canceled. He canceled. Well, His uh, sister hit her head at a cheerle- or dance practice. Oh, pretty scary. She's okay, but then he didn't. So they're coming next weekend. Okay. So they'll get me. Don't worry. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no rest for the week. You know, but it was good. I feel good around the kids. You know, I'm just, uh, it's a lot, you know. It is, especially eight year olds. That's still at the age where they need a little parental uh, intervention and guidance. You know, I can't. Now I just lock my kids' friends in the rooms with them, and I'm like, "Have at it!" Yeah, best man comes it. out alive. Yeah. I don't want them to, to grow up. I was texting you the other day. I'm like, "Is it normal for a 12 year old to just vanish into his room for like 12 hours on the computer?" You know, because I worry about that. But yeah, they they do it. You know, you know. And then I was thinking, like, he gets he's pretty busy, and you know, they're stressed out too. Yeah, he needs downtime, and I'm just trying to give him space. Yeah, you can, the best you can do is just be there, be available for them, and you know, I because Ben likes to cook. I'm always dragging him into the kitchen to make food because that's the way I can get him to like, you know, relate. Like, yeah, I'm like, here, stir this, do that, cut this. You know, what do you think we should have with this? You know, yeah, it's work but, to yeah. get these kids like, you know, but no it, it like keeps this. them involved. Like it, yeah. it, you know, so we have that in common, and you know, you try to find these these moment these places of commonality and as they get older it gets more and more challenging like this is why i'm running to like lizard shows with my middle son because like this is his thing lizards and fish so i go to the lizard and fish things and you know it's it's interesting it's not like my passion like it is his but it gives me time face time with a 16 year old which there's not so much of that yeah yeah and i'm kind of looking ahead when noah gets older and you know it's going to get less and less so i'm trying like hell like for his drum lessons i sit in the room with him that's good uh the whole time Time. You and guys couldn't like start a band like the Partridge Family. Hell yes! <laughs> and I always used to say this when I was in bands and stuff. It was always impossible to get a drummer. And I said someday I'm going to yeah, make a drummer. Right? I'm going to do it. That's right. And I joked about it. And now I'm doing it. <laughs> and he's doing pretty good with it too. So yeah, you know, that's awesome. It's just trying to keep it going and to keep these kids happy. It's just like, ugh, it's yeah. impossible. Yeah. My uh, speaking of not being able to keep kids happy, my uh, college age son is uh, home for spring break so um you know friday i flew back from from georgia and then i have two hours later i end up i have to drive and pick him up at the source mall in westbury because there's a big bus that brings all the long islanders back from scranton oh drops him off there it's better than me having to drive to scranton agreed but he's like having a rough time still um his adhd medication is tweaked a bit and he's taking adderall now like the straight Adderall. So yeah. there's plenty of Adderall around my house right now. It's, but I was never like a speed freak. Like yeah. I loved cocaine, but I would meth was never my thing. But if you read the insert on this stuff, it's straight meth. It's methamphetamine. Yeah, it's, uh, it's an amphetamine. Just um, 
dosed properly, I guess. Uh, well, well, or, or not. <laughs> or not as much as you want. <laughs> um, because, like, I, I noticed, like, we called him earlier on in this week because he was had a couple of tests. So I guess he took a couple and listening to him was not much different from listening to a couple of my friends that I would stay up all night with, like just talking, talking, talking. And I I started like feeling really bad about it. And, you know, yesterday I'm driving him to pick up his Invisaligns because he wants to finally fix his teeth that his negligent parents didn't fix Mm. when he was younger. Yeah, I blame the parents. And um, I'm like, let's schedule an appointment with your, your doctor to kind of figure out whether this medication's good because he's either up really up on it and like talking a mile a minute, or he sounds like he's going to kill himself. And I'm like, this is just methamphetamines. Like, and I'm like, do you want to talk to your, the doctor? He's like, well, if I took any less, it would have, it wouldn't have no effect on my ability to do my work. And if I took any more, I would turn into a raving lunatic. So I don't know if adjusting the dose is going to do any good. Is it the, like the long, what do they do? Extended release? No, he take? tried the extended release. Yeah. The problem with the, this is interesting. The problem with the extended release in ADHD is like, you can take the pill and then get distracted and do something else. And then it'll, uh, oh wait, sorry. That was the problem with the quick release one. Mm-hmm. We didn't give them the quick release at first because the problem is if you have bad ADHD, you'll take the thing and then get distracted. And then the thing has a half-life for like three or four hours. You'll just do the thing that you were doing and then not do any of your work. And then it's like, you can't really take another one right away. So the extended release kind of makes it a little longer, but he wasn't getting any sleep on the, it's, it's yeah. a fucking nightmare. Yeah. And you know, his mother and I now are like, fuck this, these drugs. I would rather him like, uh, find a, another school or figure out, we can figure out another way to deal with this. And the other thing is like, he, he claims like if you have ADHD and you take these drugs, it is supposed to make you normal. It is supposed to yeah. like, you're not supposed that's to get they, high. That's what they say. Right? And he's like, no, this thing makes me like crazy. Like I definitely feel it. Yeah. You know? I, I don't think that's true that it, it that it literally calms you down. If you have quote unquote, like real ADHD, I feel yeah. like, I had been, you know, professionally diagnosed as ADD. And when I would take Ritalin in college, recreationally, <laughs> I felt that shit. Yeah. I mean, maybe because I would put it up my nose, but... Um, <laughs> that's not how you're supposed to take no, that. No, and that's why I worry, too, because Noah was diagnosed as ADHD. And, um, you know, he's got the 501 or the 503 or whatever mm-hmm. in school. And so, in every doctor and teacher has said, you know, I, mostly the doctor, you know, this would really help him, right? You know, because he and I'm seeing myself in him in that, you know, I could never read a page, mm-hmm. um, get any book, and I'd read the one paragraph over and over again because I just couldn't do it. Yeah, um, and I know he's like that too because I see my younger son clearly does not have that. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a distinct difference. And I was thinking, you know, maybe this would help him, you know, maybe I'm holding back because of my insecurity about it, you know. Um, it's a tough call. Yeah, I don't we, know. We, we delayed many, many years before we went down medication road. Yeah. And, uh, and I don't know if that was a good thing or a bad thing. Um, and I still don't know. Yeah. You know? I don't know what to do. But now I'm like, there's, I have all this Adderall in my house and I, I would prefer <clears throat> that nobody be taking it. Yeah. You know. Is he not going to take, is he stop being taking it and leaving it with you? He doesn't like the idea of being on medication. He never did, you know, but I worry that the stuff is so addictive yeah. that if you get used to functioning with it, then it's a hard, it's hard to function without it. Yeah. Like I, and not to like hijack this conversation, but we were, I was watching this documentary last night on Xanax mm-hmm. and, um, just the stories of people it's on Netflix. Take your pills. Yeah, yeah, you guys should good. watch it. It's got Dr. Anna Lemke in it and a few other... Um, we'll cover it on a show. Yeah. It's really good. But just briefly, like the struggle that these folks who had taken it for literally decades in small levels, these menzos, mm. like the struggle that they had getting off it... It's nasty. It, yeah, some of them just can't do it, you know? Yeah, I mean, seizures... Um, so and, I worry yeah. about that for him. Like, is he going to get so used to this that he's never going to be able to, to come off it? And is it going to... Am I getting 10 years? Is he going to be like score meth in an alley somewhere? <laughs> like, I, I, you know, cause he had like uh, the drug period in high school. Right. You know, and college seems to be more academic minded. I, I, the I would never use the term academic minded <laughs> with, in relationship to my son. Uh, he's extremely bright, but like 
like you, he can't read a page. Yeah. You know? And rough. I don't know what to do about that. I mean, you know? my solution, which came after I was an adult still going to college, the way I got through college finally was I found Audible. Yeah. And I literally, the way I got A's and stuff is I would read the book in front of me, listen to mm-hmm. the narration, and then take notes while listening. Right. And when I did that, I could do it. Um, or, or I listen to books. Um, that's what I tell Noah to do. I said, man, you got to just, you can listen to these books. It's okay. You can still, you know, internalize the whole thing and, you know, think critically about it. You don't have to, you know, if you can't, you know, just do it that way. Yeah. And, you know, I think our whole society is kind of, we're losing the ability to pay attention. Right. And like so, that Johan Hari book. Yeah. But, it, but it's so much worse if, you've, if you're already starting from a place where you, where you have these issues. Yeah. Now, all of a sudden, you're sort of socialized that this, um, you know, the dopamine hit that you're getting from the phone, the, the, the quick attention span, the TikTok, like flipping through it every 10 seconds. Yeah. It's like, it's turning everybody into like ADD yeah. people because- like I can't sit down and read a book anymore. Like, yeah. and I used to read all the time. I have to listen to an audible now. Like I can't. I, like I can't. I can't sit down. Yeah, and, it's hard. Yeah, because we're doing so many different things. I'll read a book, and the minute I get bored, I go for my phone. Yeah, I'm like, oh, what, I wonder what's going. I should be looking at something else. You know? Yeah, it's. I'm mean, like the only reason I read at all is because Max. I'm reading to him Harry Potter. And so I get my 15. Out loud? Yeah. That's cool. So we narrate it, and then we do different voices. We like play it out like the movie, kind of. Oh, nice. And he does his good God, work. That, isn't that exhausting? No, it's fun. <laughs> no, it's exactly what I want to be doing, honestly. We're having a blast. Like We do different accents for different characters. Oh, my God. He really gets into it. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but like that's when I get my reading. You know, I get to read to Max. Like, that's cool. I like the Harry Potter book, and he gets some practice acting. So, hmm. But that's the only time I get to read. And all the books that you know for the show, besides, um, I think, Evan Haynes' book, um, yeah, which I read, but you know, if I couldn't listen to books, I wouldn't. Uh, I we wouldn't would have nothing to talk about. Exactly. Um, <laughs> I, in fact, I you got me started listening to Audible. I never listened to an Audible book in my life. Isn't it great? It's fantastic it's because I can do it while I'm running. I can do it while yeah. I'm driving. Sometimes That's, I just listen to the Lord of the Rings. You know, like this guy's got you know just the story running in the background. It's great, like just for yeah. background noise. Yeah, really. I like it. Well, because I need to have something in my ear to focus, like. It helps me to, huh. yeah. Like I sleep with a podcast or something oh, in my ear all the time. I think that's like an ADHD thing too, because because my my wife does it. Like she, oh yeah, and my other son too. They have to fall asleep. Like, well, my wife doesn't do it anymore, but uh, like falling asleep with the TV on with some kind of noise in the background, like yeah, I, white I, noise, I, white um, noise. I can. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of um, audibles, speaking of audible books, we're going to talk about a couple. With, these books were also written on paper, by the way. Yes. By by an English professor. Yes. Yes. So hi, I have an idea. Okay. Hi, hi have an idea. Hi. I have hi. An, hi. I have an idea. Aha. Uh-huh. Uh, why don't we take a short break? Yes. And we'll be right back after these words. And we're back. Hello. Hi. How you doing? I'm good now. You ready to go? You drink? Like, leave? No. Oh. Second half. We're ready to go. <sighs> Part two. James Brown. I feel good. I might drop music in there, but I'm, I'm constantly concerned about those crawlers finding copyright violations. And, right. You know, Shut us down. Yeah. <laughs> like they care. I think they do. Yeah. They I, do. They do. It must be automated. It is automated, and, and automation has no soul. True. So yeah. it's just a violation, and it'll generate a letter from James Brown's you know, lawyer, and you th- family. You think his whole life he's had to say, no, 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 not that James Brown. Cease and desist. Yeah. But, um, oh, yeah, probably because trying to find information him on the internet, I get an awful lot of interviews with the godfather yeah. of soul, yeah, and who- not too many with, uh, with James Brown. He would have been a great interview. The Godfather of Soul? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. This guy, I don't know. He doesn't give too many interviews, I don't think. Um, who is James Brown? Well, he wrote three books. He's the author of several novels and the memoirs that we're going to be talking about today, The Los Angeles Diaries and This River. His most recent book is Apology to the Young Addict, which was published in March of 2020. The LA Diaries came out in 2003. Mm. The River came out in 2011. And Apology to a Young Addict 
the young addict came out in 2020. Mm. So they're, they're described as a, uh, um, tr- what do you call it? A trilogy? Trilogy. Mm. I'm like a triplet. A triplet. That's music. <laughs> um, you know, he's uh, a fairly well-renowned author, even for his fiction. Uh, he won an, an NEA fellowship in fiction writing and the Nelson Algren Award in short fiction. He's been published in GQ, the LA Times, the New England Review, the New York Times Magazine. I noticed he didn't put the New Yorker on here, which is kind of funny because in his book, he goes into like how when he optioned his first couple of uh uh, novels to Hollywood to have movies made. Uh, he was also submitting short stories to the New Yorker mm-hmm. and he was getting rejection letter after rejection letter. So it looks like he never got published in the New Yorker. Or he would have put it. it right in there. <laughs> but anyway, what makes this guy kind of interesting? Um, like his, his backstory is really like, you know, when you talk about adverse childhood experiences yeah. and trauma, this guy had them in, in buckets, man. Yeah. I mean, his, his mother got arrested for, for an arson where somebody, was it was an insurance died. fraud? Yeah, she like tried to burn down a, a building. She was committing all kinds of corporate fraud and insurance fraud. Yeah, and it broke up. It broke up the marriage, ruined the family. His father ruined yeah. the family financially. His father never recovered yep. financially. Died a, a, a poor man. Um, his brother and his sister both committed suicide. Yeah, um, you know, a few years apart from one another. His ex wife died shortly after giving birth to another man's baby. Uh. His father was an alcoholic. His brother was a, an actor. As was his sister. Which is a, an right? adverse childhood experience to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> well, his brother was also like diagnosed with an IQ of 170 or something. Did you remember he, that? I didn't, but yeah, I think he was like a genius. Yeah. yeah. So, um, and he acted in a couple of, of movies, um, one of which like... I guess I read an interview with with James Brown a couple of years ago where Quentin he listened to an interview with Quentin Tarantino when Tarantino was praising his brother's acting in one of the movies where he was you know one of the two movies he was in that he had a starring role. Oh wow. And he said I wonder if anybody remembers you know this guy no kidding. you know because he died at 27 you know he was alcoholic and he took oh, his own life. Magic so, number. Yeah, so it was right the 27, 27 Club. That's yep. Jim Morrison, Janis Joplin, Pigpen from the Grateful Dead, uh, Jimi Hendrix, Jimi Hendrix yep. right? Kurt Cobain. Yep. Wow. It's the age to die. That's crazy. Yep. I didn't even think about that. Um, what did you think of the writing? Now, you're an English major, yes. so I bet you loved it. It was brilliant. Um, <laughs> the way, and this is why, like, why did I tell you to say, like, you got to read this book. You got to listen to this book. When I listened to this, I, you know, because I listened to a lot of these addiction memoirs, and this one just stood out. I mean, the narrator delivers it perfectly. And, you know, it's written, like, it's just really descriptive. It's not overly poetic. And it takes me back to those same moments that I, like, that I was, you know, relating to when he's telling the story. Like, he mm-hmm. really has a knack for description, but not using, like, you know, analogies and the metaphors that you would think of. But the ones he uses, like, hit the nail on the head. And so I was like, this, it's just too good, you know. Uh, that's what I thought. I thought he was a brilliant writer. I, uh, I the writing is definitely a cut above the average addiction memoir. Yeah. Although, to be honest, I probably prefer Nouse's Joseph Nouse's style better because I, yeah, there, there's a reason that I don't read a lot of modern fiction, and this is going to make me sound like such an elitist asshole. Yeah. But most of it, when you read it, sounds like it was written by an English professor. Uh huh. And this guy, usually in fact, they are. <laughs> is yes, yeah. right? And and English professors typically don't have the breadth of experience. Uh, to write about compelling things in their lives, right? But this guy was a fucking mess. I mean, he was all over the place. Yeah. He he, while he was, you know, writing novels and uh, teaching in San Bernardino to sort of make enough money to support his wife and his three boys, um, was also disappearing for days at a time and getting fucked up on cocaine and yeah. and. Uh, but I, but the writing and the subject matter seemed discordant to me because so many memoirs of drug abuse and addiction that I have read are the writing is not the primary thing. Right. It's the, it's the story, right? Right. Here you got the writing and the story, right? But I thought the story was a little disjointed. Like it kept, and, and I read an interview with this, with this author with James Brown that came out a few years ago. And apparently some of these pieces that became the LA diaries were published 
independently of one another. Like in short stories. Yeah, and then right. they were sort of aggregated, <clears throat> excuse me, and tied together to put this book together. And I, I can I can feel that sometimes because it doesn't flow. Yeah, the you know? story arc isn't like what you would think of as a well thought out trilogy. It kind of the stories overlap. You know, there's some retelling, some a little bit. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, it's a it's little a, disoriented. It bounces around, but the you know, and and that it, it annoyed me during the Los Angeles Diaries. It annoyed me a lot less during the River. I thought, mm. I thought the River was a more mature piece of writing, and and that makes sense because. Um, the L.A. Diaries, he wrote it during a period, his first period of sobriety. Yeah. The first time he was able to put a year together, but then he relapsed immediately afterwards. Right. Right. And then he went off the the deep end for like another five or six years, which is why The River came out in 2011 and The L.A. Diaries came out in 2003. And I think that's a more accurate um, or a more relatable experience then the I had a white light experience in rehab, and I never drank again. Like my old sponsor used to say, yeah. like who can who the fuck can relate to that? Like this is a more more accurate of how these things go. You have some periods of sobriety, and then there's a fall, and then you get back up, and and it takes a lot of failure, I think, and hopefully you don't die doing it. So that's the other. <laughs> You know, yeah, hopefully, and he didn't die. And I bet, although I bet his ex-wife and his kids probably wished he was dead a few times because yeah. his story—he he really doesn't pull any punches about how f- he treated people. Yeah, you know, um, there there are some some stories like even when he was like living at home and he and his wife were sort of half getting along. Like he was a great a asshole. Yeah. Like like he. What one time he he tried to um, smooth things over after a bender by going out and buying his wife a Vietnamese pot belly pig. Yeah, remember that story? <laughs> that was a great. It's one of my favorite stories. So he brings the pig home, and then it's like the whole chat. It, there's like some really dark humor yeah. in this book, right? And really so dark. it goes into this whole thing about him building the 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 pen for the pig and all this stuff. And then the pig fucking hates him and he hates the pig. Yep. So he's like <laughs> ticking off how much money he spent on the pig. And then, you know, the pig is just waking him up with a hang. He's got a hangover every day. He fucking hates that pig, pig wakes man. him up screaming every morning. So, you know, but then the, the point where I was like, I don't like this guy as a person. Like he goes down with this can of gasoline and he's yeah. just about to light the pig on fire. He and I was like, revenge. what kind of a fucking maniac is this guy? You but know? it's a very poetic when he gets locked out of his house when she finally changes the locks. He comes in and the pig is sitting there is it, on uh, his easy chair right, watching the, television. With, <laughs> with the legs flayed over yeah. the easy chair. Yeah, that was funny. It's yeah. like the ultimate insult, you know. <laughs> <laughs> his arch nemesis, this pot billy pig. Yeah. You know, it represents, you know, his wife to him for sure like and then she's choosing the pig over him right right yeah, but uh yeah is that just one of many of his uh demoralizations but i mean you know that you know you're gonna light a pig on fire and then you after your your long-suffering wife like who's put up with you for so many years you end up like having an affair with your student and then you're the one that breaks off the marriage like i'm like ah yeah fuck I mean, this guy you he know? describes that chaos and the desperation and like some of those scenes because it is a very you could tell he's a screenwriter too because it's very visual yeah you, know, you see the scenes like he's writing in for the movies you know when he's he describes that where he shows up to his school to teach and he's just cranked out of his yeah. mind. He hasn't slept in days. He's got, you know, I think it was meth that he had on him. Mm-hmm. He passes another teacher to his office and she makes some <laughs> comment. They all know. Right. And then he describes getting in front of this class tweaked out and like dealing with the students and just, ugh, I could feel that. He's like giving, he, he was giving this amazing lecture and then the girl in the front row is like, we covered this last week. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> He's like, did we? I, he had no recollection. You know? Yeah, he always just dismisses the class early. That's right. like his go-to. He's like, you know what? I'm going to dismiss the class early. And it's just like, just like, but I, I can relate to that. Like, you're you're doing your, your, your work. You're trying to keep your home life, but you're keeping this habit. And it just owns you. And just mm. trying to constantly not, you know, not show that you're doing that. But it gets harder and harder as your, you know, appearance deteriorates. You smell like, ugh. Well, he, what he does a really good job of in the first book is talking about how you get from like, I'm just going to stop in this bar and have a quick drink on the way home to like showing up at home three days later with a bag of Coke or crank in your pocket, you know, and how that, how you go from having the best of intentions mm -hmm. because we always did, right? We always had, I'm just going to have one drink and I'm going to go home. Right. And then, you know, there's, 
the glow starts and then all of a sudden you you lose track of time. He, like one time he was like, I, I was, he was on his way home and this was like after a bender, he was on his way home. He'd talked to his wife and he stops in a bar because it was like too early to go home or something. Yep. And he has one drink and he looked at his watch and it was five. And then the next time he looked at it, it was one o'clock in the morning. Yeah. You know? And it's like, he's bargaining with himself that, that dialogue that we go through in our heads, you know, but are you familiar with that time warp though? Like yep. I remember that like so well. Like I'd, be, I'd go to a bar after work at five, and then I'd look at my watch. It's like I got to catch the two o'clock boat home yeah. to Staten Island. Like oh, holy yeah. crap! That like where coke, did the last eight hours go? That's coke, man. Um, you just turn around. It's five a.m. You had your phone on off or something. You turn it on. Someone who's looking for you. Maybe a <laughs> wife. Maybe a girl. <laughs> blowing up yeah. oh my god yeah yeah and then you know you leave wherever you're at and the lights just coming up and the birds are starting to tweet yeah and you have no money and you have no dr- drugs left yeah and he's very descriptive <laughs> i wanted to play that one part of the oh, book yeah. so he's describing this isn't going to sound that great because it's not connected to the machine but um and it's i'm catching him in the middle of it it's long but he's describing and he, he says you a lot like then you do this and you know mm-hmm. he's trying to uh, and so I'll just play. This is him describing when he approaches that point in his uh, active addiction where things are just closing in mm. and that sort of thing. So it's going to start mid um, uh, comment here. You're not getting any younger. You need a little bump. Compliments of methamphetamines to get you through the long, hard day. Crank is cheaper than blow. It better fits your budget. Crank is also stronger. Seven times stronger on the central nervous system, and that night you absolutely have to drink if you hope to sleep at all. At this stage of your addiction, your drinking and using has little to do with pleasure or even escape. From here on out, it's about maintenance. From here on out, it's about feeding those mutated cells, fighting off the intense depression that follows a binge, and trying, to the best of your weakened abilities, to carry on the bare semblance of a life. You are teetering on the edge of becoming the very thing you most feared. Another loser. Another zombie. One of the walking dead who wander the streets late at night, nameless, lost, and forgotten. Hmm. Five. Oh. Wow. Yeah. You know? Definitely an English professor. Fuck, man. <laughs> yeah, I was, I'm listening to that, and the way that guy delivers it, it's so, it's like psych, psychopathic. You know? Well, who is that guy who uh, did the narration? He, he's a little, I thought it was a little theatrical at times, but it, it was, was a okay. bit contrived. You know? But, you know, when I, I, I just leaned into it, I'm like, this is a play. You know, this is a monologue. Mm. It's, you know, Shakespeare. It's, you know, really just shaping those images. Yeah, I guess, yeah, it might be an English nerd. If I had one if one complaint about that first book, it, like there wasn't enough of that stuff. There was an awful lot of like he's really exercising the childhood trauma yeah. in this book because he goes back, you know. I mean, right after his mother gets arrested uh, for setting this fire, um, you know, she has a deal. She goes to prison. She gets out, and by the time she gets out, the husband is have is fucking the uh yeah. the the housekeeper yeah. right and and they ended up staying married until he died but um but she leaves him his mother does and they get pile in the car and they drive to la they stop at pismo beach they take a picture you know on the beach and stuff and yeah, then they like move that. into this small apartment and you know his brother leaves the first chance he can get because it's too crazy you know yeah. and his mother is like drinking a lot and he starts drinking at the age of eight um so you know I, the guy's childhood he didn't really have much of a, a normal childhood i yeah. mean what, whatever that means it, it just was so far outside the norm um yeah there's a lot of a lot of the things that we say would help you know create an addict he has them in spades you know and all over the place for a while you know he learned uh uh, how to interact with substances from his brother who you know ends up you know trying to get into acting but all the whole the while all the while like he's drinking like a fish and there was that one scene that he talked about where he had to pick up his um 
his brother because his father had had a stroke and he goes shows up at the airport and he picks up his brother his brother's still dressed in the cop uniform that he was wearing yeah. on the set of the last thing that he was acting in and he reeked of booze and he clearly hadn't slept in days and um you know his brother ends up blowing his brains out in his apartment like at, at age 27 like we said and then you know yeah. and and so much of like what happened to him after that you know and then his sister several years later ends up jumping from an overpass yeah. you know and killing herself and so he's like the the only one yeah. and he has these conversations with his dead family yes too. like they they haunt him like he's obsess obsessively yeah. talking to his dead dead family um and you know that that basically set the scaffolding for for everything in both books like because it, it always went back to like him having couldn't couldn't get the images of like because he had to clean up his brother's apartment yeah. after his brother killed himself. So he went in and there were all the, you know, the bloodstained pillow and the maggots underneath the pillow and stuff and how that got stuck in his head. And then the thing that, that I thought was really interesting, because he's like, I've seen death at a young age more than most people. And, and then he relates these two stories of when, when he was <laughs> like in the, in the apartment, like he saw some baby fall from a, from a fire escape and land on the ground with his head went splat on the ground. And then he watched this other girl riding a bicycle, get creamed yeah. by a car and her intestines were out all over uh, the road. And I'm like, where yeah. the fuck did this guy grow up, man? Yeah. Like I, I never, I, did you ever have that close an encounter with death when you were a kid? Because it seems like it followed this guy everywhere. Yeah. yeah he seemed to just find it everywhere he turned. I don't know if that's just uh, South central LA or, <laughs> or what, but yeah. yeah, I mean, and, and if uh, and then on top of that, the um, the other side of this story that um, I don't think um, we talked about is how it depicts the the seedy dark side of the Hollywood machine. Mm. The writers, he has that oh, yeah. scene of him going to like meet with this executive, and then there's a sniper shooting type of thing, right? Right, and um, it gets ruined, but. Just and then the and then the actor, his brother, and just how not unglamorous, depressing, impossible, and dark, you know, that gets. And it's probably that way for like ninety five percent of people who go to LA to seek their fortune, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it's just um, there's a lot of darkness to this book, but um, there is light there, I think, and and I think that's kind of what he does a good job of. Even after all of that, you know, he's got this hope. Uh, he's got this, you know, he has his sobriety and he has his hope. Yeah, you got the sense that, that there was a hopeful ending of that second book because, I mean, it ends with him in a mental asylum on Seroquel. Like, <laughs> Maybe I'm thinking of after the third book, but he, he's working through it like he survives it and he gets through it. And then in the third book, I won't spoil it for you, but oh, things you. do get better. Oh, so good. Maybe I'm skipping ahead. <laughs> um, but it's a great depiction of how bad things can get and how you can keep you know pushing through and there's always redemption if you could stay out of prison <laughs> and don't die yeah even if you do go to prison you stay can. out of prison and don't die yeah. um yeah he um he's very good at setting a, a scene because he the first two novels that he had were, were optioned by hollywood but they ultimately were not made into movies so and he goes through that process step by step of how you get a novel option yeah. when the people stop calling you back when it becomes clear that it's not being made yeah. um or they rewrite your script and you have to work with this yeah. jerk off other author who's just like changing all of the details of your story yeah and it's, i uh, i usually don't I usually hate stories about Hollywood. I don't know why. Yeah, but mostly because everything seems so phony and fake and everything. And but the, but where he was meeting with that 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 thing that you the scene you alluded to a few minutes ago where he was meeting with he was had an appointment with uh, an executive to pitch I to think. pitch yeah. and the guy kept him waiting like two hours mm -hmm. and then a sniper started taking shots at the building and the executive finally pokes his head out of the office to like run for cover and he tries to introduce himself yeah. to him and pitch yeah. and the guy's like are you fucking crazy there's a sniper out there you yeah. know he's like i just sat there thinking that this was the best thing I yeah do yeah you know and the guy comes in he's so you gotta wonder like you know and, and this sort of came up at the end of the second book like he finally started to accept that there were perhaps mental health diagnoses that he had that were unrelated to the alcoholism and the drug use, yeah. like that, that pre-existed the drug use and the alcohol use. Yeah. And so he started taking Seroquel, which um, got rid of his bad dreams, also got rid of his good dreams. But um, Yeah, he, he comments on how uh, when he takes 
I think it was Seroquel or one of the other. The S. He was talking about the SSRIs. Yeah, Seroquel's an antipsychotic. But so yeah, but he's describing that you know that those antidepressants where it did help him manage his anxiety and fears. Mm-hmm. It also took away took the the joy and the, and the pleasure and other things. And that that's a common you know complaint people have. Yeah, and um, you know that's uh, you know you're trading not screaming through the night for maybe I don't get as happy when the Knicks uh, score a three pointer. I mean, isn't that sort of a microcosm of recovery, though? Like, the highs are not so high, the lows are not so low. You know, you trade that that sense that anything could happen that, uh, yeah. you know, for a life of a bit more stability and regularity. Yeah, you get sanity. Addi- I got addicted to chaos, some yes, people would say. Absolutely. Um, That's what was so appealing to me about drinking yeah. and, and in the past using drugs, because to me, it was a great adventure to have to venture into a neighborhood that you were unfamiliar with yeah. in the middle of the night with a pocket full of money, and you were equally as likely to get robbed as you were to get drugs. And Yeah, but um, I mean, I've managed to invite chaos into my sober life right? <laughs> right. that's the thing like i've continued it's a different my, kind of chaos though. it is you know and um, my life is so chaotic and there's always something new and maybe that's how i keep going i don't know do you miss the old chaos i do sometimes sometimes i miss that my number one the only thing i needed to worry about is get money and get high yeah uh, but you know that's that's a false memory because that was torture you know, it's easy to romanticize, but it, it was definitely torture. We're better off here. Yeah, it was never like, um, it was never that way, though, right? Because even while you thought that was the only thing you had to worry about, there was all this other stuff that you should have been worrying about. You just about, weren't right? paying attention. Like, I remember my, you know, my drug use was all when I was single and had no kids. So, like, for me, like, I, I remember those days, and I think about how incredibly, like, irresponsible and egotistical it was to just live my life in a way where all I was doing was seeking adventure and pleasure and not giving two shits about anything else, yeah. you know? But I guess when you're young, that's, you know, you think kind of think that way anyway. I yeah. So it sort of fits the brand. I just remember driving, driving, uh, on the Long Island Expressway. And I don't know if you, you know, this spot, but it, like you come over this hill before you get to the entrance to the Midtown Tunnel and you can see the city. Yep. And if you hit it just at the right time when all the lights pop on, it's like, you look at it and you're like, fucking Disneyland, let's go. Let's you know? go. And you just get in there and you just go fucking mental. At least I did, you know? <laughs> and I, I love that. The shining city on the hill. That was like, for me, that was like the best thing in the world. But I realized like, I could have done other things. I could have made that city my bitch in, in other ways yeah. rather than being like end up in alleys and f- weird fucking apartments and shitty bars at five o'clock in yeah, the morning. You, you know? could be going to a matinee of Phantom. Yeah, or something like that. Your boyfriend. <laughs> right, yeah, I, I, I guess. <laughs> so uh, I think, uh, so that's that's this river. And well, I got LA a quote. Stories. Can oh. I read a quote from the author that I read in an interview? Yes. Maybe we could just talk about it for sure. a minute or two. Um, okay, so this was from an interview he did with... Some literary... Was that you farting? Oh, that was your elbow. <laughs> like, we need you to explain that because yes. people are going to hear it. That farted on Mike. <laughs> uh, okay. Anyway, um, this, is, this is James Brown. I'm not sure, but I believe it was Bukowski who said something to the effect that being a drunk requires great strength and perseverance. Waking up each morning drained and hungover from the night before and then having to go about your day making a living is far more physically and mentally taxing than waking up sober and refreshed. Being a drunk, as, as they say, is hard work, but it's hardly good work. In fact, it's ruinous and self-destructive. And sadly, typically, we inflict so much more, if not damage, on others than we do on ourselves. Uh, by, by that, I mean it's one thing to hurt ourselves if we choose to self-destruct, so be it. But in the process, we inevitably inflict great harm on those who love us the most, wives, children, husbands, close friends. So, yeah, you know, that's I mean, some perspective. And he gave that interview when the last book came out when he's 60 years old. Huh. So, Yeah, he's a very interesting character. I think he's still sober now. and um, Ten years. Ten years. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I recommend those books. I, I do want to listen to that last one again. Um, and tell us what you think of these books. Are we crazy or what? Uh, Mike R. at MiddleAgesRecovery.com. Are we crazy or what? Are we crazy? <laughs> and uh, tell us what you think. And uh, are we doing recovery in the news? It depends. Yeah! All right! Recovery in the news. Recovery in the news.
And in the annals of the what the fuck files, it's, uh, it's like crack. Chicago woman gets addicted to eating toilet paper rolls. <laughs> <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? I don't know what to say about this. Um, this was going to be the main recovery in the news this week, but I had wanted to touch on another article also. Okay. So let me just do this one real quick. Because to- toilet paper. You've heard of sugar addiction. I have. You've heard of alcohol addiction. I did. But a person addicted to toilet paper? Why? That's hard to come by. Uh, Keisha from Chicago. Uh, Ryan, do you know Keisha? Right. I guess we'll wait for that. Right. Um, she's addicted to eating toilet paper and says she goes through about 75 sheets of paper a day. Holy sheet. That's a lot. Seeing her addiction, her mom says it's like crack for her. Uh, while you may think this habit is just something weird that the woman does, it is actually a clinically condition. It's called xylophagia. So this woman, I guess, was on the TLC show, My Strange Addiction. Yes, I've I think seen we've that talked one. about that on the show yeah. before with a prior. I think we discussed a prior toilet paper yes. eater at yeah. some point in the past. Mm. Um, it's a real problem in America. It, but, <laughs> I mean, she... Uh, I thought this was interesting because I guess you can be addicted to any kind of behavior, right? Sure. And if it gets your dopamine uh, pathways energized, then it can become an addiction. Her description of it really kind of sat with me, though. It was like, I think, this is what she says, I think I crave it because I love the way toilet paper feels on my tongue, how it dissolves when it hits my tongue, she explained. Weird. Yeah. But like, so it's like the whole ritual, right? You tear off a square. Yeah, you get that you dopamine. You get ready, you yeah. put it on your tongue. Um, dissolves the sensation. Yeah, she, she does experience problems in the restroom if she consumes too much toilet paper hmm. and even has stomach cramps, which is ironic, right? Do you need more toilet paper if you eat toilet paper? Yeah, it's just a, a self-fulfilling... Her mother worries explosion. about it. Uh, every time I'd see Keisha, she'd have a tissue in her hand and she'd try to hide it behind her back. <laughs> if, I, if you tried to take it from her, she'd get upset. So, I mean... Yeah, that's addiction. Process addiction, right? Like... I don't know, you know, part of part of me wants to dismiss this and part of me thinks that this fits so well with yeah. all these models of addiction that we've been studying. Gambling, you know? um, eating, it's yeah. compulsion, it's doing something that harms you against your own will sometimes. Yeah. yeah. And it's uh, just weird and strange. Yeah. Yeah, my strange like what, addiction. What gets somebody to toilet paper and not to drugs? You know what I mean? Yeah. Like at some point, like if she stopped eating toilet paper, do you think she'd become like an alcoholic? You know? I mean, probably. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, that. That's like, where does it going to pop up? Is there a twelve step group for people that eat weird shit? There must be. If there is, somebody tell me about it. Yeah, I mean, what is what is the a therapist or you know a doctor do with that? You know, and of course, putting these people on my strange addiction and exploiting them is not a good thing. Does I would it argue. help? I don't know. I do don't they know. get them help? The people just. You know, it's for titillation. Yeah. Which is, you know, half the reason why I picked it for the show, which I don't know what that says about me. Well, next week we're covering uh, Thousand Pound Sisters. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I feel guilty now. Mm. So let's talk about this other one. Do you mind? Go for it. Okay. Opioid. This is an article from the New York Times yesterday. Opioid settlement hinders patients' access to a wide array of drugs. Have you heard about this? Mm. Uh, I came across this because it was very difficult to get Adderall, when we finally had a prescription for my son, they were like, we're out of Adderall. And I'm like, right. how are you out of Adderall? Everybody in America is on Adderall. That's why they're out of it. Yeah. Um, but I guess there was an agreement between the attorney generals of several states and major drug distributors um, to make it harder for doctors to prescribe opiates. But it also affects ADHD medication, anxiety medication, and other pain medication. Drugs of abuse, I think they call them. Yeah, but I mean... Yeah, you can abuse anything, right? As sure. Keisha and her toilet paper would tell you, the first ones to tell you. So why why are you singling out some of these things and saying, you know, and, and the result is that tens of thousands of, of drug orders have been canceled. It's disrupted the flow of medication to distributors and, you know, drugstores just don't have these medications anymore. Yeah. And, and CBS, people who have relied on them for years are having real trouble. And there's big restrictions. Um, I remember, I can't remember why I was prescribed an opiate years ago. I mean, I was an addict at the time. That was one reason. But <laughs> CVS had a policy they just instituted that you couldn't get prescribed more than seven days worth, mm. no matter what. Like, even if you had a prescription for 100 pills, you'd get seven days at a time. Wow. You know, so they were taking, but for someone who's like in their 80s and needs it for cancer pain or something like that, it really creates a problem for people who legitimately need it. Mm. Yeah. 
swept up in the scrutiny are college students from far from home trying to fill their Adderall prescriptions, patients in rural areas where it's customary to drive long distances for medical care, and hospice providers that rely on local pharmacies for controlled substances instead of on a specialized supplier that would um, be exempt from the limits. So, um, yeah, this is this is a problematic. Um, it seems like a weird place for the government to be regulating when they should have been regulating this all along. Yeah. But, you know, there's patients who have a legitimate need for these drugs and they're the ones that are suffering from the fact that the Sacklers were allowed to run roughshod over all of America and turn a generation of poor people into opioid addicts. Yeah. Yeah. It's a real problem. You know, one bad apple spoils the bunch, as they say. As usual, it's like, you know... Socialism for problems and capitalism for everybody else. I don't know. Never mind. You heard it here, folks. Yeah, Recovery yeah. in the news. I'm not even sure what that means, what I just said. <laughs> I want to hear what you people think about this. You people. You listener people. And guess what we have today? Week in weird. Uh... Remember you used to get mad at me when I would fuck up that intro? I'm still mad at you for those times. <laughs> I hold a grudge. Uh, Bigfoot photographed by game camera in Washington State? Question mark? By Tim <laughs> Banal. Good old Tim Banal is back. A fantastic photograph circulating online shows what appears to be a hairy bipedal creature, which some believe to be a juvenile Bigfoot passing directly in front of a game camera in Washington State. A hairy bipedal creature could be anybody in Washington State. <laughs> Read uh, the remarkable it's image. a lot of hippies in Washington. The remarkable image captured back in August of 2020, but only came to light in the past weekend when it was revealed by the Rocky Mountain Sasquatch Organization, <laughs> which received it from a member of R-M-S-A. the family. R-M-S-A. R-M-S-O. Which received it from a family uh, who owned the property where the picture was taken. Said to have been snapped on a sizable piece of land in the state's Pierce County. The individual claims that they had largely forgotten about the photo until they... Why would you forget about a photo of Bigfoot? (laughs) Until they rediscovered it during a recent computer upgrade. There are so many photos of Bigfoot they have on their computer. You're like, ah, I'll get back to that. In this intriguing image, a curious hairy figure can be seen from the waist up. No, the, thank, thank goodness. <laughs> thankfully, the waist <laughs> up as it seemingly triggers the game camera by passing right in front of it. That'd be better if you just saw it from the waist down <laughs> passing in front of uh, the peculiar... Big foot. <laughs> That's a big... <laughs> It's at least 11 inches. Uh, The peculiar being's close proximity to the camera allows for one to see a fair amount of detail, including that the interloper sports particularly long hair on its head and two hirsute... Hirsute? Wow. On its head and two hirsute arms, which are outstretched, as one might imagine. Some Sasquatch enthusiasts argue that the figure in the photo could be a juvenile Bigfoot. More skeptical observers, however contend that the picture is simply, quote, too good, and as such, is likely a clever hoax. Mm. With that in mind, what do you make of this jaw-dropping photo? Send your thoughts to Mike R. at MiddleAgesRecovery.com. Oh, please do. And uh, Bigfoot is on the loose. And let me tell you, I'm looking at this picture, and um, it's definitely, without a shadow of a doubt, a juvenile Bigfoot. Oh, really? On his way to high school. <laughs> Well, if the dead are not touring, it could be uh, it could be some hippie chicks like just looking for something to do. Um, you know what you should do with your boys uh, to, to for bonding? You should go squatching. Squatching. That's yeah. actually a verb now. Yeah. People go squat. Go squatching upstate. I've always wanted to. You could find piles of scat and yeah. try, try and convince your kids that from a Bigfoot rather than some big dude. I would love piles of Bigfoot scat. And that is a week in weird. Duh. Well, uh, that about does it for today, folks. I know I had a good time. Did you? Uh, surprisingly, yes. Um, no, I always have a good time. Good. Visit us at middleagesrecovery.com being fixed right now. Is it? Currently, it's a little off, but it is being fixed. Did you find somebody to fix yes. it? Yes. I finally got a guy. I was talking to him a few days ago. From in Bangalore? Yeah. Yes. Hmm. 
somewhere. But anyway, it's being fixed. Podbean, Apple Podcasts, Facebook, Instagram, Spotify, YouTube, and Twitter. So tweet us to twat you twit. Support your favorite show. Please, please, please give us a five star review. Please um, go on an Apple. Nobody did it last week. I know. Despite the begging. Come the on. The fucking begging. Guys, a review. I'll read it. Say whatever you want, but give us five stars. Um, we got a great private Facebook group that's free and fun, and we're on there. Search it on uh, Facebook. Um, join us on Patreon at patreon.com slash recovery in the middle ages for a higher level of support and hanging out. And finally, the best way to help the show is to share it with a friend. Yes. If you get something out of our show, please, please, please share it with someone and help grow the army movement. And as we say, non profit perfecto. Progress, not perfection. See you next time. Oh.